بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله آمين يا رب العالمين so continuing with where we left off last week uh, on the course uh, with the course on evolution of fiqh okay in which we are going over the different phases of how fiqh developed the difference between sharia and fiqh uh, and the four madhahib and uh, how did they get evolved what were the differences between them why were there differences between them and how should one look at these four madhahib today um, and how we should, uh, should resolve those differences in our current times. So last time we started talking about the first stage which was the foundation stage and this was the stage in which the Prophet ﷺ was receiving the wahi. This is the first stage from where fiqh starts uh, developing because the sources of fiqh remember are the Quran and the Sunnah. So the first stage was the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, roughly 23 years from the year 69 to 632. As I said last time, also that this is based on uh, the Gregorian versus the lunar calendar. You'll find minor differences. Some dates, some books you will read, it will say 610 to 632. Some will say 69 to 632. But it is roughly that same same time period and uh, the Quran and the Sunnah were the only two available sources for fiqh so there are no Imams there are no Madahib at that time there are no uh, fiqh differences amongst the ulama okay um, the only authority in this time is one man the Prophet of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he tells you what is halal, he tells you what is haram, he is the one answering the questions, he is the one giving the fatwa, you know, he is the one in complete uh, authority. And so that is why you don't find a lot of differences in this era. This is a very stable era because there is no difference of opinions coming up. Because you cannot differ with the Prophet of Allah. Even if you think something else should be the case, you cannot go to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and say, no, I don't think it should be like this, it should be the other way. Okay. Also, we said that the Quran represented the authoritative source, whereas the Sunnah represented the explanation of the Quran. So, the Sunnah is very important. Unlike many people today who say that Quran is enough, we do not need the Sunnah, uh, we just need the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Sunnah is not reliable and so on and so forth. Uh, that is a very false notion because without the Sunnah you cannot even understand the Quran. Okay? You will end up misguiding yourself, you will end up misguiding others. Um, if you just look at the Quran by itself in a linguistic you know, tafsir, there are tafsir which are totally linguistic uh, in, their, in their interpretation. They don't use sunnah. If you look at those tafsir and you compare it with those tafsir where sunnah is used, you'll find a big difference in the rulings which are coming about. Okay, why? Because sometimes a word might mean something to you today, but it meant something else to the Arabs when the Quran was being revealed. Sometimes a word might mean something in general, but the Prophet meant it, the, or the Quran meant it in a very specific situation. Sometimes the Quran came for a general law, but you might consider it to be a specific law. So you cannot just base your interpretations, base your fiqh on the Quran alone by your own understanding of the Arabic language. Okay? And what about those people who don't even have that understanding of the Arabic language and they try to then come up with rulings based on the translations of the Quran in their own languages. That is really problematic. So this is the first stage. What was the method of legislation in this stage? The various sections of the Quran were generally, generally uh, revealed to resolve problems which were happening in the time of the Prophet Wasallam and the Sahaba. All were direct answers to questions. Okay. The fiqh which we have from this era, which is in the Quran and the Sunnah, if you look at it, it was coming down for two cases. 
One, something was happening with the Muslims. So Allah wanted to guide them in that situation. So Allah would send ayat related to war. Allah would send ayat related to peace. Allah would send ayat related to the accusations of the kuffar. Allah would, you know, reveal verses, answering questions. We talked about Surah Yusuf last time. Surah Yusuf, the entire surah was revealed as an answer to a question from the Bani Israel who brought the Prophet ﷺ in front of them and they said, how did the Bani Israel end up in Egypt? If you are the Prophet of Allah, tell us how did he, how did the Bani Israel end up in Egypt? So the whole surah, Surah Yusuf was revealed, talking about the story of Yusuf ﷺ and how the Bani Israel ended up from Philistine to Egypt. So this was the uh, discourse in the first uh, era, in the foundational stage that the verses were, were revealed in Mecca and Medina and these were generally answers to questions as well as situations which were happening with the Prophet ﷺ. A number of Quranic verses were direct answers to questions raised by Muslims as well as non-Muslims. And that is why we said a lot of ayat in the Quran, they started with the phrase, Yes alunaka. They ask you, okay, and then Allah would tell the answer. So a lot of laws, especially the verses related to the laws, halal and haram, a lot of them start with this phrase, yes, alunaka, they ask you or they um, want to inquire from you regarding these situations. We have, for example, the ayat in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah talking about fighting in the forbidden months. Okay, there were these four months which were forbidden, these were haram months, um, and the Muslims asked the Prophet ﷺ regarding fighting in these four months. Should we fight the Quraysh in these four months? Uh, if, if they attack us, what should we do? Okay. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses, first of all confirming that yes, it is haram to fight in these four months. These four months are sacred, meaning that these are not just made up by the Quraysh or the pre-Islamic Arabs, that they have a basis in the Sharia of Allah, which goes back all the way to Ibrahim ﷺ. So these four months were regarded as haram from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified that if they fight you, then you fight them. Meaning you have to defend yourself as well. Because the Quraysh, one of the things they used to do was they used to play around with the haram months. For example, Muharram is one of the haram months. So they would say, okay, let's postpone this month, haram month, to the next month. So let us fight in Muharram and we are going to replace it by another month which will, will make haram for ourselves. So they used to play around with changing haram months. Whenever it suited them, they would say, okay, we cannot fight in it. Whenever it did not suit them, they said that we will, uh, you know, do the opposite. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if they fight you, if they attack you, then obviously you have to defend yourself. So that was an example related to Yas Alunaka. Other ayat, for example, related to alcohol. Again came, the initial verses came, uh, that they asked you regarding khamr and maisir and you know all these, uh, all these uh, evils, gambling, you know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that these are evils, that the, you cannot do them. Even though there might be benefit, there might be some benefits in alcohol, but the evils outnumber or are greater than the benefits. So, so on and so forth. So, a lot of these verses were direct answers to questions which were posed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Also, we said regarding the situation of women who are going through their menstrual cycle, um, there were some practices which used to go around before Islam related to women, um, especially amongst the Jewish people. The Yahud, they used to separate the women who were going through their menstrual periods, they would separate them, they would separate their food, separate their bed, separate you know, everything. They wouldn't even sit with these women in the same room. It was considered haram for a man to sit with a woman who was going through her periods, um, eat with her, you know, or have company with her. So these were all rules which were extreme rules. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he revealed ayat clarifying that all of these are extreme rules and the only rule which is applicable is not to have physical or sexual relations with them during their menstrual cycle. All the other things you are allowed to do and there is nothing wrong in that. 
A number of other verses were revealed due to particular incidents which took place during this first foundational era, the era of the Prophet We talked about the story of Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu. Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu, he saw his wife committing adultery with another man. And he came to the Prophet reporting this incident and asking him to carry out the punishment on his wife. The Prophet ﷺ, he insisted on bringing four witnesses because that was the law. If somebody accuses somebody of adultery, they have to bring four witnesses. If you don't bring four witnesses, then you will be lashed 80 stripes. Okay, this is in Suratun Nur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this clear. So the Prophet peace be upon him said, bring four witnesses. Hilal ibn Umayyah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, if one of us sees with his own eyes, his wife committing such and such with a man, do you think we will go around looking for witnesses for that? Meaning it, it is not practical to ask for witnesses from a husband or, for, from, or from a wife in this situation where they have directly witnessed it with their own eyes. But the Prophet peace be upon him kept on insisting this is the law. I cannot change the law for you. Which shows that the Prophet peace be upon him was not making up these laws. He was waiting for Allah's commands in order to uh, implement them. So then what happened? Jibreel alayhi salam, he came with the ayah once again in Surah An-Nur, which clarified this situation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instituted a new law, which was that if a husband or a wife accuses another of adultery, they have seen it with their own eyes, then they don't need four witnesses. What they need to do is, they need to swear by Allah that they are truthful and a fifth time to swear saying that if they are lying, then may Allah's curse be upon them. So this is a very big, big vow. You know, who would make a vow or, or a swear that you know, if I am a liar, may Allah's curse be upon me. So that, if you are a true believer, <laughs> then that is, a, that is something you would not even think about. Doing. Even if you have one point, you know, or point one percent doubt about what you're saying, you wouldn't say what you're saying because you're afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. And the wife or the other partner can also re retaliate this swearing by swearing themselves four times that what this person is accusing them of is wrong, is incorrect by Allah. And if they are truthful, then may Allah's curse be upon me. So this is the order of Li'an. Um, where you know the husband and the wife can uh, accuse each other and also protect th themselves from each other through these uh, swearings. So this was a direct situation where the Quran was revealed to solve a problem. There is a problem in the community, what should we do? Should we follow the old ruling? Should we follow the new ruling? That is why it is important for those people who give rulings to know the entire ruling about a situation. Just knowing part of the ruling could misguide you. I mean, imagine if we don't know this verse, and this happens in, in our time, in an Islamic country where, you know, you have all the, the, the setup for Islamic laws to be implemented, and then somebody comes and says, you know, my wife did that. You say, okay, bring four witnesses. If you don't have four witnesses, we are going to lash you 80 times. Okay, so then you are, follow, you are following Islam, yes. But you are following it in the wrong situation. You are putting an ayah in a situation where it does not belong. So that is why it's important to know all the rulings related to that particular point you are talking about. The same thing happens with us when we are reading hadith. One of us will read a hadith in Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim about whatever su subject. And then we will say, yeah, this is, the, this is how it is. But have you studied all the hadith related to that subject? Have you studied, do you know that maybe sometimes the hadith might have been abrogated by another hadith which came later on? Ali radiallahu anhu one time he saw in the street a man, he was reading the hadith to the people, teaching hadith to the people. Ali radiallahu anhu asked him, do you know the subject, the knowledge of Nasakh and Mansukh, the abrogated and the abrogator? Do you have the knowledge of those hadith? He said, no, I don't. He said, then why are you misguiding yourself and the rest of the people by teaching them hadith and they are going to take whatever they are going to take from it? Meaning you are not eligible, you are not even qualified to teach hadith to the people because based on what you are teaching them, they might take rulings. And since you yourself don't know what abrogated what, so that means you are not qualified. So it's important for us 
to make sure that whenever we are talking about a subject, we look at all the evidences first, not just one evidence or evidence from one school of thought or one scholar. Okay? The same was the case in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Sunnah, once again, uh, as we said earlier, was part of the Wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet peace be upon. Even though it was not directly the word of Allah, but the meaning of the Sunnah comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the source of all revelation. The Prophet obviously was not making up his own Sunnah and trying to teach it to the people. So with the Sunnah, the same thing would happen. Either the Sunnah was there to answer direct questions which people had, the Prophet would answer them directly. Or it was the situation, the case that there was a new situation which came and the Prophet peace be upon him guided them in that new situation. Okay. How did the Prophet do that? Sometimes he would answer directly. If, you, if a Sahabi comes to him, he would tell them, okay, this is halal, this is haram, outright. Sometimes he would guide them about halal and haram by showing them his example. He himself would do something and the Sahaba would see it. They say, okay, if he is doing it, it has to be halal. If he is not doing it, it has to be, we should stay away from it. And sometimes he would show his approval for something by remaining silent. This is also sunnah. This is called the silent sunnah of the Prophet where he saw two things happening in front of him and he did not say anything. Or he saw something happening in front of him and he did not object to it. Then the Sahaba took from this that it is okay to do those things. Those are permissible things. So there are three ways the Prophet peace be upon him would legislate or, or approve laws or disapprove laws. Either directly or by being silent about those things or through his action. Okay, by showing them what to do and what not to do. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would correct the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whenever he would make a mistake. Which shows that he was a human being. He is not somebody who has the knowledge of the ghaib, the unseen. He only has knowledge of whatever Allah would reveal to him. In other situations where Allah did not guide him, he would use his own understanding to do whatever he wanted. And if it was right, then Alhamdulillah. But if it was incorrect, then Allah would immediately correct him. The reason for that was because he is the Prophet of Allah. If Allah does not correct him right away, what will happen? What will happen if the Prophet ﷺ made a mistake and Allah did not send a revelation to correct him? What would happen? Because people are going to take from him that knowledge or take from him his, his actions and are going to use it as a proof. Okay? Don't we use his sunnah, his hadith as proof? Imagine if his sunnah was not guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah did not show him the right and wrong, then we would be following just a human opinion. Okay? And that is why there is a difference between following the Prophet and following an Imam. That's the difference. With the Prophet even his personal opinions, Allah would correct him whenever he is wrong. With Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam whoever, Whenever they made a mistake, we don't know. We don't know if that was a mistake or not a mistake. Because Allah was not uh, you know, revealing texts to them. So that is why we have to be careful when we are following anyone other than the Prophet ﷺ. He's the only one you can close your eyes and follow. Because even his mistakes, Allah corrected while he was still living. This also shows that he is not the author or he is not the founder or he is not the source of Islam himself. Okay? Like the Orientalists, many people who accused the Prophet said he made up the Quran himself or he copied it from somebody. Okay? If he did that, he would never have acknowledged his mistakes and he would never have corrected his mistakes. This is not human, part of the human nature. Whenever I make a mistake, most likely I'm going to try to hide it. Okay? I'm not going to come out and say, okay, this is a mistake, now this should be the correct ruling, whatever I used to do was wrong. You know, that, that doesn't happen, especially with religious people, people who are sources for religion. Okay? This is a proof that the Prophet ﷺ was not the author of the Quran. Allah would criticize him, Allah would correct him. We have the example of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the blind companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We've mentioned his story a lot of times. 
when the Prophet ﷺ was talking to a group of Quraysh leaders and this blind companion came up to him and asked the Prophet ﷺ questions. He wanted to learn from him. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, was busy talking to these big leaders. So he frowned at Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately revealed Suratul Abasa. Abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma wa ma yudrika la'allahu yazzaka so on and so forth. You know, all the one who frowned at the, the blind man. Okay? Maybe he came to you seeking knowledge. Maybe he wanted purity. You would have taught him and he would have become purified. You are concerned about those big charts, those big leaders whom even if they don't come to the straight path, you are not to be blamed for it. Okay, so on and so forth. So, once again, this is not the attitude of somebody who is writing the book himself. Where I would be, you know, frowning at a person and talking to somebody and immediately I criticize myself for it. No, 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 no. I shouldn't do that. Yeah. I wouldn't have frowned at him if, if I knew, you know, this was right or wrong. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever he would make a mistake, Allah would correct him immediately. Another situation was the situation of the, the POWs, the prisoners of war, uh, after the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr, the Muslims, they succeeded and they were able to take 70 prisoners of war from the Quraysh. Okay? Now these prisoners of war, they were, this was the first time the Muslims had encountered this situation. What should the Muslims do with these prisoners? Should they kill them, execute them because they were fighting the Muslims? Should they leave them free? Should they ransom them for money? What should they do? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, like was his habit, he came to the Sahaba and he asked them for opinions. Okay? And this is something we should learn from the leadership of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Asking for opinions from those whom you trust, from those who have knowledge. Okay? The Sahaba obviously were the trustworthy companions. So Abu Bakr anhu, was of the opinion, we should leave them or ransom them for money. And the reason he had for that was, he said, these are our brothers from our own tribes, our relatives, and if we free them, then maybe one day they'll come to Islam. Because we're, this is like a da'wah for them. Then look at us, the Muslims, how generous, how kind we are. Even though you came to kill us and fight us, we let you go. Okay? And he also said that the Muslim st state is weak economically. We need money right now. So the money which we are going to get from these prisoners of war as ransom, we can use it for good project. So this is his understanding. He gave his opinion. Umar ibn al-Khattab gave the opposite opinion. He said, no, we should not ransom them. I disagree with Abu Bakr. We should execute them, each and every one of them. Not just execute them, but you give me my relative for execution and you give Ali his relative for execution and we will execute it. And his opinion was that this will send a very strong message to the Quraysh that they should not mess with us again. Okay? We got their prisoners and we you know, gave them a good, good message, a, a strong message. Um, other Sahaba, there was another companion. His uh, uh, opinion was even more extreme. He said, let's you know, put like dig a ditch in the earth and we will put like fire, burn a fire in that ditch and then we will throw all these prisoners in it. So there were these differing opinions. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then he uh, at the end gave his verdict and he sided with Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr and the Prophet peace be upon him had very similar kind of personality. The softer side, the easier side. The Prophet always liked to take the easier option, okay? the merciful option. He is Rahmatul Lil Alameen. Okay? He is the mercy to all mankind. So, said, okay, we'll ransom them for that. But once they made that decision, the very next day, Umar ibn al-Khattab was uh, walking by the house of the Prophet and he saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr both crying outside the door. Both of them are crying. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, Ya Rasulullah, tell me what happened so that I cry like you cry. This was Umar. He wanted to feel the pain and the suffering of the Muslims. That's why he was a good Khalifa, a good leader. He was, always had that, that, uh, uh, that sense of, of sadness and grief for the Muslims. Whenever they were in trouble, he felt he is in trouble. And he said, if I feel like crying, I'm going to cry. And if I don't feel like crying, I'm going to force myself to cry with you. Tell me what happened. 
So the Prophet peace be upon him said, O oh Umar, we saw the punishment of Allah right next to the trees of Medina coming down upon us. As if the punishment was coming upon the, the Prophet peace be upon him, himself. He's not talking about the, the Muslims. He said, as if we saw the punishment next to the trees of Medina, the date palm trees. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses in the Quran where Allah said it was not befitting a Prophet that he caught the prisoners of war the first time he, and he let them go. Allah's opinion was the opinion of Umar. Allah supported the opinion of Umar. Muslims should have sent a strong message first time. But Allah said in those ayat, had it not been written before, then Allah would have surely punished you severely, O Prophet. Allah would have punished you severely. This is the Prophet of Allah would have been punished for his incorrect fatwa. How about how about the rest of us? How about the Imams? Or how about people like you and me who have no knowledge at all and we give fatwas le left and right and tell each other this is right and this is wrong? We need to be careful. We need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected him. See, he made a wrong decision. He did his best according to what he thought was the best decision. According to Allah, that was not the correct decision. But since now he had offered that, so Allah did not force him to change his decision. And that's what happened at the Battle of the battle of Badr. So this shows that the Prophet is protected. Even when he makes a mistake, Allah would clarify. Allah would send revelation to correct him right away. Now when we say mistakes, there is a difference between making mistakes and making sins. Okay? In Islam, we do not believe that the Anbiya, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were involved in doing corruption and major sins. Yes. It is at the discretion of the leadership. Yeah, it is still at the discretion of the leadership and both are allowed. But in that specific instance, Allah wanted the Prophet to, you know, that would have been the, the better of the two options. Now, obviously, you can also ask, if Allah wanted him to do that, he could have revealed it to him, right? Why didn't Allah reveal this before? Which shows that this was part of the plan of Allah. But at the same time, Allah wanted to show the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he was wrong. Even though that is what Allah eventually had written for him to select. Because Allah is the one who wrote everything to start with. So he could have informed him beforehand, but he did not. To show the Muslims that the Prophet is a human being. He can make mistakes. Allah could punish him. Allah could punish him as well. He is just another creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is wisdom in why Allah did not reveal. But the eventual ruling is, you can do either. If you feel that one is better over the other in your situation, then you, you go for that one. And once again, you should try to consult the people of knowledge and see what they, they want to do. Also, this shows another thing. There are two extremes in leadership. One people who do, one kind of leader is who don't consult the people at all. They're like these dictators. Okay, I'm going to tell you what, what is right and wrong. I don't want to consult you. That is one extreme. This is incorrect. The other extreme is which says, okay, you consult the people and then you have to go with the majority. Prophet ﷺ on many occasions, he overruled the majority opinion amongst the Sahaba. Okay? Even amongst the, the companions themselves, Abu Bakr anhu, when he became Khalifa, the majority opinion was not to send the army of Osama to, to the Roman Empire. The Prophet has just died, the rest of the tribes are rebelling, they might attack Medina. We need this army here in Medina. Abu Bakr overruled all of them. He took their opinion but he did not carry out the majority opinion. He still went on with what he thought was the right thing. So in Islam, the last final decision is still with the leader. He should consult the people and he should take their opinion if he feels that is a good opinion. But he doesn't have to take the majority opinion. He can choose between those opinions the one which he feels is the correct opinion. Because if you have to take the majority opinion, why do you need a leader? Just have, you know, 10 people, 12 people, whatever the majority says, you just do it in everything. No, the leader has that, that uh, preference. He can overrule, he can veto the vote, you know, and, and overrule the majority. In most cases, they did not do that. Because in most cases, the majority of the people would agree on the right thing. The majority of the good people, they would have good minds, good taqwa, they would agree on the right thing. But there could be situations where one person, his knowledge is so far above the others that the others might feel we should go this way but this one person knows better and so on and so forth. 
Okay? So these are both extreme opinions. We should not follow uh, either of them. Any questions on this? How legislation was being made through Sunnah? So Sunnah is not perfect like the Quran, but it is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the point. On one occasion, one of the Prophet Sallallahu companions, and we discussed this issue as well, he was uh, a companion who used to travel by the sea a lot. So he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, we sail the seas and if we make wudu with our fresh water, we will go thirsty. Okay? Because you are in the sea for maybe months and you take a little bit of water with you. If you use this drinking water for your wudu, what will you drink then? Okay? So he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we can make wudu with the sea water. Can we use the sea water for making wudu? The Prophet ﷺ replied, its water is pure and it's dead. The sea creatures are halal, meaning permissible to eat. So two things we learn from this hadith. The first one, that the sea water is pure water, meaning you can use it for wudu, you can use it for washing. Okay? It might not be suitable for drinking, obviously, because of the contents, but it is otherwise pure. Um, the second thing we learn is that anything which lives and dies in the sea, the creatures of the sea are all halal. Okay? And this is the correct of the two opinions. There are two opinions regarding sea animals, sea creatures. One opinion is that you have to apply the same rulings as the land, land animals, meaning things which are predators with claws, fangs, you know, all those kind of features in the sea, you cannot eat them. That is one opinion. The other opinion is anything in the sea which lives and dies in the sea is halal. The second opinion is the correct opinion because of the evidence. The first opinion is based on um, opinion, is based on scholarly opinion using the yas. First opinion is based on analogy, using the tool of analogy. Okay, land animals we apply this rule, so that means sea animals we have to apply the same rule. So it's based on analogy. The second opinion is based on hadith. And this is that hadith, and this is an authentic hadith of the Prophet peace be upon him, narrated in many, many books. At-Tirmidhi is one of them. Okay? So, you can eat a whale if you get stuck somewhere in the sea. An octopus, no problem. Sharks, you know, sharks are fine. You know, these are all halal. As long as they are living and dying in the sea, these animals are all halal animals. Okay? Huh? Fresh <laughs> sushi. Yeah, exactly. So you can have a meal and, and festivity in the sea. Um, but what we learn from this is what? That a question is posed and the Prophet ﷺ answers the question. Okay? Meaning this is how the laws are being revealed through answering questions. Okay? Uh, this is not in the Quran, but it is in the Sunnah. Okay? So not, not all questions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw it fit that he answers all of them in the Quran. Okay, then the Quran would have been a really big book if all the questions of the Sahaba and the Muslims and the non-Muslims were all answered in the Quran. Allah left a lot of answering uh, left, uh, left it to the Sunnah of the Prophet And so that is why we need to take the Sunnah as well. Any questions so far? Yes, yes. But it is a sea animal, meaning it does not live on land. That's what I mean. Living and dying in the sea means that they, this is where they survive. They cannot survive on the land. Okay, like some animals, they can survive on both land and sea. For those animals, you have to use the rulings of the land animals. Then you have to use the ruling of the land animals. But for the animals which live and die in the sea, meaning they only survive in the sea, these are the ones you use. Uh, is there a term? In Science for the animals which only live in the sea cannot survive in any medical uh, aquatic, aquatic, aquatic aquatic animals. Uh, yeah, as opposed to amphibians. I'm sure there is a term, but it might be just too technical. But as long as we understand. Marine. Marine animals. What's the other thing? Life, but, but they're not. They're, they're in the yeah, they can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use this method of legislation? What, what, is the, 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 what are the two methods once again? Well, how does Allah reveal laws in this foundational stage? Number one? No, but how? How? What happens that Allah reveals a law? Either direct quest, questions are answered, that's one way, and the second way is? Situation happens and Allah reveals something related to it. Why is this the approach of the Quran and the Sunnah? Is because it will uh, achieve a gradation in the enactment of laws as this approach was more easily acceptable by Arabs and to all human beings. Okay? As human beings, we like things which give you small short-term goals. If I give you a goal which is really far above you and I say this is what, where you have to reach, it might be very tough for you to reach there. But if I divide it up into levels and say before you go to the 52nd floor, you have to start on level 1 and then you have level 2 and level 3. You know, the same thing happens with the map. Okay? When you are using GPS, how does the GPS take you to your de destination? It divides it up into these segments. Okay, you go from this road to this road and then you take a ride from here and so on and so forth. If the GPS just tells you the address at the end of it or shows you a big map here, this is where you need to go. It will be a little tough, you know, and the purpose of the GPS will, might be lost actually. You can do a better job with a, with a, uh, you know, a regular map maybe. So the same thing in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants us to get to our goal but He has devised a path which is easy for us. A situation happens then we learn a new law. Okay? As we grow into our religion, we get stronger and stronger in our knowledge. You don't end up being a scholar from day one. You have to take these baby steps towards your goal. Yeah, the, the people who are working with the, the converts, they need to understand the limitations and uh, the limitations of the human being in general. That you cannot become from day one, start practicing all the laws of Islam. That is why the Prophet wasallam he told Mu'ad ibn Jabal, عنه, when he was sending him as the governor, he said, you know, teach the people of the book, Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they agree with you, then teach them the five daily prayers. If they agree, if they do what you're saying, then teach them that they need to pay zakat. If they agree, so the pillars, he, he taught them the pillars. But even in the pillars, he did not say, tell them all the five pillars in one go and they have to do all of them. He didn't say that. He said these steps. Okay? So from this hadith, we learn for the converts the same thing. First and foremost is tawheed. First and foremost is their beliefs. You need to work on their belief system. Let's say you have a new convert and they are not fasting in Ramadan. Go to, no, 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 you have become a kafir. You cannot do this, you are a munafiq, you are this and you are that. No. Okay? Because maybe they don't even have the correct understanding of Allah yet. Maybe they are just interested in Islam and they feel it's the right thing for them, but they don't have any foundation in it. So you need to work and recognize where they are, which level they are, and then work accordingly. So that is why there is a general da'wah and then there is a specific da'wah. That's why it's important to make one-on-one -on -one connections with people. Because everyone might be at a different level. You cannot you know, give them a general ruling and say all of you have to get there by next week. No, maybe somebody will get to stage one by next week. Another somebody will get to stage four by next week. So you need to have a specific plan for each and every individual. And that can only happen if you get close to these people. You know their thinking. You know what their limitations are. Okay? Uh, hijab, for example, a sister comes into Islam. You say, if you don't wear hijab, it's haram, and you are a big fitna, and you know, so on and so forth. You give her all the, all the uh, rulings related to hijab in day one. No, maybe, you know, she's not, never had hijab all her life. Maybe she needs to start off with some kind of a modest dressing. Maybe she needs to understand what modesty is all about first in Islam, and what is the value of modesty in Islam. Maybe she needs to start off by guarding her gaze. You know, so you need to, to come up with the right plan for the right individual. So the same thing would apply to new Muslims today. Uh, obviously, you cannot say to them, it is halal for you to do all these bad things, these evils. But at the same time, you don't push them too much where they're going to break and they're going to 
leave. A lot of times new Muslims leave the deen because of too much pushing from the Muslims. Because the Muslims want to teach them everything in day one. Okay? So be careful with that. Be careful. Okay? Also, the Arabs, also the Arabs were a stubborn people. Okay? Arabs were a stubborn people. Uh, not just the Arabs, but people who have deep cultures, you know, philosophical ideologies, where they have had a system for centuries, and they are used to a certain system, then these people become stubborn about these systems. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed everything together as a lump sum and said, this is your Islam, it would have failed. Because their arrogance, their stubbornness would not have allowed them to absorb these new teachings. Even amongst the Sahaba, after years of training with the Prophet peace be upon him, there were occasions when they would go back to their old ignorant ways and would say, Ya Ahlul Quraysh, come, come. And they would say, Ya Ansar, come, let's fight. <laughs> People of Medina, come. And you know, a small argument would end up in a big fight between the Sahaba after years of training. So what does this show you? This shows you human beings do not change easily. It takes a lot of hard work to change somebody's personality. A lot of hard work to change somebody's heart. So what about you yourself and me myself? Do you think we are willing to change quickly or are we struggling? Whenever somebody wants to change us, do we try to struggle with this person? Do we, or we easily, you know, listen to this person and say, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever you say, I'm going to just change myself overnight. Or, no, it doesn't happen like that. So the Arabs, they wouldn't have liked that approach. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have revealed everything together in one lump sum, then they would have rejected it. Also, Arabs were a free people. There is a difference between nations which have been ruled by foreign powers for centuries and nations which have lived freely. Okay? For example, if you look at the area in Iran, Afghanistan, these countries have never been ruled by foreign powers. These countries have always they have a long history of free freedom, independence. It is not easy to make them do what you want. That's why even now, these are the countries which resist foreign powers the most. Because they, they don't think like that. For them, freedom, independence means a lot of things. Whereas, compare the, this to other nations which have long histories of British rule, colonization, you know, other foreign powers. These are the nations even today are willing to be ruled easily. So, the Arabs of the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they had the mentality of freedom. No nation had ruled them. The Romans are on one side, the Persians are on one side. Nobody is interested in them and they have their own independence. So you cannot now start imposing on them a law system, a revelation which will come on them and say, this is what you need to do, otherwise, <laughs> they'll say, okay, otherwise what? Bring it on. So you don't deal with these people in this, in this way. The same is true right now in the tribal areas in northern Pakistan. In Afghanistan, these areas have never been ruled, they've never accepted any dominance from other powers. You don't deal with them with power. You don't deal with them with bombs. No, that is going to backfire. They're never going to, they, because they become stubborn in their ways of thinking. You have to deal with them with peace. You have to deal with them through dialogue, through mercy, through understanding, through education. This is the long-term plan. If you want to change a people, that's how you change a people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created these people knew what is going to work and what is not going to work. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way he legislated things was in a slow process. One by one, the most important things first. In Mecca you have Tawheed, in Mecca you have Hellfire Paradise, in Mecca you have, you know, prophethood, in Mecca you have stories from the past nations, in Medina now they are ready. You have laws coming up, you have Zakah, you have Siyam. You have things which they never used to do before, now they are ready to do those things. So you have to build the platform first and then start putting the bricks on top. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. It also made it easier for them to learn and understand the laws since the reasons and context of the legislation would be known to them. Remember the Arabs were not highly educated nation. 
have to remember this. They're not like the Romans and the Greeks who have these discussions on philosophy and they are able to absorb, you know, knowledge from different previous nations and so on. The Persians also on the same side, Indians, Chinese, you know, these were all nations with a lot of background in philosophy, in education, you know, intellectual arguments. Arabs were simple people. They would not get into philosophy. They would not get into intellectual arguments. The Quran, is there any intellectual book which talks about arguments and gives the best arguments better than the Quran? The Quran is a highly sophisticated, a highly intelligent book which gives wisdom of the highest level to a people who have no history of wisdom and intellectualism. So what is the best way? How are you going to make them understand the message of Islam, the philosophy of Islam? How are you going to make them understand the laws, Sharia? Sharia law, I mean, how many years does it take for one, be one to become a scholar so that they can start issuing fat fatwa in Sharia? Years, it takes, you know, degrees. Five year bachelors, then two, three years masters, then they go for PhD and then they teach and then finally after 15, 16 years of scholarship, they reach a level where now they're able to be a judge in some Islamic country, right? Now imagine a person, a Bedouin in Arabia, and you're expecting him to rise to that level of intellectualism. How is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? That's a miracle actually. This is one of the miracles of the Quran, raising the intelligence levels of the Arab people to the highest intelligence level of their time. Okay? Where they were now the best judges in the world, where they were now the best you know, custodians of law, they were the ones running libraries, they were the ones running discussions in philosophy, raising the intelligence level of people. How will that happen? Through a slow process of growth. Okay? So, a lot of wisdom in why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the laws the way He did. Another reason is, once you know the context of revelation, don't you think you will understand the revelation better? If you, you had a real situation, for, for example, Hilal ibn Umayyah and his wife, okay? Imagine that situation never happened to them and the verses of Le'an were given to them. Here, read these verses. If a husband says four times and then the fifth time and if the wife says four times and then a fifth time, it's just like any other verse for them. But since they had gone through the situation themselves, imagine their understanding of those verses whenever they would read those verses later on very different understanding. Imagine Abdullah ibn Umm, Umm Maktoum's understanding of Surah Al-Abasa as compared to our understanding because he has lived through that, that surah. The surah was revealed regarding his situation. So this is also an added benefit of revealing things with a context. A situation, Allah made a situation happen and then revealed a verse according to that situation. Or should I say the verse was already there and Allah created the situation for it so that it could be revealed, right? Because the Quran was already there. The Quran was not being revealed according to the situation that Allah is sitting there and saying, okay, now this happened, let me send this. Now that happened, let me. The Quran was always there with Allah in Lawful al Mahfud. The situations were written afterwards. So subhanAllah, the whole setup in which the Quran was revealed was so that Quran could be revealed. That's how we should look at the Qur'an's revelation. Not that, you know, the Qur'an was revealed according to the situation of the people, but rather the situations were created so that the Qur'an could be revealed like that. Okay? It's a very, very uh, a wise way of revealing something. Any questions on that? Do you understand this? An example of this gradual approach is that in the early Meccan period, Salah was initially twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. This is how prayer started. Prayer is the only act which was revealed in Mecca, the only law. Out of the five pillars, Shahada obviously was there from the start, but other four pillars, Siyam, Zakah, Hajj, you know, the prayer was the first one to be revealed and the only one to be revealed in Mecca. All the others were revealed in Medina. A prayer is the only one. But how did Allah start? Did Allah say, okay, five times a day with the sunnah and the nawafil and everything you have to do? 
back home in Pakistan, if you don't, uh, if you don't pray 17 rakas in the Isha prayer, your Isha is not, you have not prayed Isha prayer. You have to pray 17 rakah, which includes the fard, which includes the sunnah, which includes the, the nawafil, everything. And you make 17. Allah did not start like that. Allah started simple. Twice a day. Just pray two times a day. One in the morning, one in the, the night time. Okay? Shortly before the migration of the Hijra to Medina, the five daily prayers were enjoined on the believers. However, the Salah at the time consisted of only two units per prayer with the exception of Maghrib, which was three units. So even the current units, the Rakat, for example, you pray four in Dhuhr and Asr. It was not like that in the start in Mecca. It was two. You just pray two Rakats for Dhuhr, two for Asr. Okay. And the rest of them are you know, the same. Isha also two. The, oh, the longest prayer in Mecca was the Maghrib prayer. Right now, the shortest prayer is the <laughs> Maghrib prayer. Maghrib is the shortest prayer, actually, because, you know, the, the Imams usually recite short surahs in them because your, your time is time limit is limited. But in the start, Maghrib was the, the highest which was asked for. This is, if you are praying Maghrib, it's, it's like you're doing your utmost in your salam. Okay? So slow, Allah was very slow and gradual in His approach. After the early Muslims had become accustomed to regular prayers, the number of units were increased to four for the residents, except for Fajr prayer and that of the Mabu. This is why when you're traveling, you shorten your prayer. This is why when you travel, you shorten. That is actually the original ruling. You go back to the original ruling when you travel. The later ruling was for the resident, you have to pray four. But the original ruling was two. So as, as, as soon as you leave your town, as soon as you go out of your town and you're traveling a certain distance and there are these differences of opinion on what that distance should be, but as soon as you leave your town, you can start shortening your prayer. You go back to the original ruling because the ruling of the long prayer is for the residents, people who are living in a town. Okay, so when you are in Morgantown, you pray for, when you're outside, you're traveling, you shorten it. Okay, questions? Yes, yeah. uh, uh, the story of Isra and Mi'raj, when did it happen? Yeah, this is the last one. When the, the okay. complete prayers were revealed, the five were revealed, that was Isra and Mi'raj. Before that, there was also a ruling for Salah, but it was the ruling of two, two, twice a day, not, not five times a day. The five times a day was in the story of Mi'raj when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed 50 and we know the story how it was 50 and then it got reduced to five. And this is also a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there were 50 prayers <laughs> I don't know how many of us would be able to keep up with 50 prayers a day with already we are struggling with five times a day right so alhamdulillah this is in Sahih al-Bukhari this uh, information you can find in different hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari it is authentic information now we move on to a new, new topic which is the content of the Quran Okay. What are the themes of the Quran? Okay. Because we're talking about that first stage, and that first stage is going to set up the foundation for the later stages to derive fiqh from. So the primary source of fiqh is the Quran, obviously. So we need to understand what are the themes of the Quran and how the Quran was divided. The scholars they divide the Quran into two basic um, eras: the Meccan period period of Mecca and the Medinan period. And there is lots of differences of opinion. What do you mean by Meccan period and what do you mean by Medinan period? Okay? Because there were verses or there were surahs revealed to the Prophet ﷺ when he conquered Mecca at the end. Should you count them as Meccan or Medinan? Which one do you go for? Those were revealed in Surah Al-Nasr for example. Or Verses related to Hajj, they were revealed. Verses related to Riba, they were revealed in Mecca. But the scholars do not count it as Mecca. So there is differences of opinion. The most agreed upon understanding is anything which was revealed before Hijra is Mecca. Anything that was revealed after Hijra was Medina. Even though it might be in Mecca. Okay? Even though that verse might have been revealed in Mecca. Badr, the battle of Badr, 
or Hudaybiyah. Where are these places? Are they in Mecca or in Medina? Where are where is Hudaybiyah or and where is Badr and where is Tabuk? Mecca or Medina? They are outside Mecca and Medina. They are not part of Mecca and they are not part of Medina. So where do you count them? Those verses. That is why the scholars say the easiest classification is anything which was revealed before Mecca, uh, before Hijrah is Meccan, and anything that was revealed after Hijrah was Medina, regardless of where it was revealed. It doesn't matter. Okay? So in Mecca, the Muslims were an oppressed minority, whereas after their migration, their Hijrah to Medina, they became the ruling majority. So there is a big difference in the Quran's content in Mecca as opposed to Medina. The situation is completely different. Okay? In Mecca, they are being oppressed. In Mecca, they are a minority. In Mecca, they have no power. In Mecca, they are hiding their faith. So, the Quran cannot tell them to do things. <laughs> the Quran cannot reveal verses about okay, establishing justice in the law, in the, in the court system. You don't even control the court system. That Those verses do not make sense. Islam cannot tell them, go and fight go and make jihad against the disbelievers because they are a handful of people. They're going to destroy themselves. If, if they take up arms, they're going to destroy themselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed the content according to what was happening to the Muslims in Mecca. Okay? Thus the revelations of the Quran during the two phases had unique characteristics which distinguished them from each other. That is why if you read Orientalist scripture or books, one of the criticisms they have about the Quran is that in the Meccan phase, Islam was a very peaceful, nice religion. In the Meccan phase, because the Prophet was, you know, weak, so he was telling his companions about these nice, good teachings. But as soon as he migrates to Medina and he gains some power, then he became like a, you know, kind of an evil guy <laughs> suddenly, and now he wants to control and dominate the world, so he started telling his people about verses on jihad. Okay, this is a criticism which the Orientalists have about the life of Prophet Muhammad and the content of the Quran. But from the Islamic understanding, we know that the difference was there because of the difference in situation they were in. The ultimate goal was there, yeah. The ultimate goal of Islam is to spread everywhere the message of Islam. That is the, the ultimate goal. Dawah, making dawah in the entire world. But you cannot start off with this goal by taking step number 99, right? You have to take step number one, as we said earlier. And step number one is building faith. Step number one is building your own community first, taking care of your own community first, taking care of your own family members first. It cannot be your own family is disbelieving and your own family is disobeying Allah and you are going out for da'wah, you know, on a 40-day trip from one masjid to another. <laughs> doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Okay? This is not the methodology of Islam. Islam's methodology is start with your own self, start with your family, start with your neighborhood, and then you go in these big circles away from yourself. Okay? And by the way, I have nothing against the brothers of you know, the Tablighi Jama'a because I really respect their efforts and everything. I just disagree with some of their methodology. Um, but I do appreciate their effort and but award them for whatever good intentions they have. So don't take me wrong, especially since this is being recorded. <laughs> I don't want YouTube comments uh, after this video, you know. The whole debate starts after this. So I have to be politically correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Meccan revelation starts, obviously, this is the period of the revelation in Mecca with the beginning of the prophethood. Which year did the prophet, peace be upon him, become a prophet? What was the year? 610, 69, depending on which calendar you follow. Until 632, 631, once again, depends on the calendar you follow. And when was Hijrah? When did they make Hijrah? Huh? 622? Yeah, almost 621, 622. Almost 13 years after prophethood. Right? From the age of 40 to the age of 53, he spent in Mecca, and from 53 to 63, 10 years in, in the Medinan phase. Okay? 
Uh, the revelations of this period were mainly concerned with building the ideological foundations of Islam, Iman, faith, in order to prepare the early band of converts for the difficult task of practically establishing the social order of Islam. So uh, this might also answer your question, Sister Sana, as to how the revelation started. So if we follow, for example, with new converts, the Meccan strategy first, before we go to the Medinan part, that would be wiser. My opinion. The first thing which was concentrated in the Me Meccan period was Tawheed. The Meccan revelations declared Allah's unique unity and pointed out that gods besides Allah are no benefit. So a lot of verses were revealed in the Meccan period, especially if you look at the short surahs which are at the end of the Quran, most of them are Meccan. What is their content talking about? Allah being the Lord, Allah is unique, Allah is the Ahad, names and attributes of Allah, Allah is different from His creation, the idols, you know, they cannot benefit you, they cannot harm you. So this is the, the main topic of the Meccan revelation is Tawheed. Because there were a lot of problems in Tawheed amongst the pre-Islamic Arabs. So that needed the most time. And I feel even in our times, a lot of Muslims have a lot of Aqidah problems. Before you can start going into the laws and you know hadith and you know all of these other branches, you first need to make sure that your aqidah is strong and it's pure. And we assume that we, we are fine in our aqidah. Most of the Muslims they assume my aqidah, I might not be a very practicing Muslim, but my belief in Allah, oh, it's perfect. You know, it's solid, it's it's strong. But there are cracks in there. If you investigate deeper in your own life, in your own heart, you'll find cracks there. You'll find knowledge which you do not have regarding your aqidah. Okay? Uh, so we need to build on aqidah, start with tawheed as much as possible. Especially for our youth, with our children. And especially those children who are growing up in these cultures and societies, non-Muslim cultures and societies, we need to work really hard on their tawheed. Because in Islamic countries, a lot of tawheed is built up through the environment. Where you see your grandmother, you know, she's making dua, he's asking help of Allah when she's in trouble. Where you see your parents, they are, you know, uh, they are reciting the Quran and they are, you know, establishing their, their, their dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where you see the love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the family or in, in the environment when you go out there. But here, when you're growing up, you're growing in a vacuum. You're growing isolated from all those those things which are going to just naturally build your aqidah without you knowing it, without you even working for it. Okay? So here you need to work hard with your children. Don't assume that since your aqidah is good, my children's aqidah is the same. No, you have to build it, you have to work on it. Okay? Number two, Allah's existence itself was mentioned in the uh, Meccan revelation. Some of the early verses presented logical arguments proving the existence of Allah for the few Meccans who actually denied it. The majority of the people of the world at that time did accept in God, did accept that there is a creator. Okay? Uh, unlike today, now it's starting to change. Where even those who profess faith, many of them, they really don't believe in their practical life, the existence of a God. Okay? It's, a, it's a very spiritual thing, okay, I believe there is a God. But in the practical dimensions of life, you don't see that there don't see like a following of that apida or that concept that God is the one who created everything. You don't feel that attachment you know, with that. But in the pre-Islamic era, there were also some people like that. There were some individuals who had a problem in believing that there is an existing God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He concentrated a few verses in the early Meccan period related to arguments which would prove the existence of Allah. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly talks about the, uh, the creation. You know, don't you see the creation? Don't you see the camel, how amazing it is? Don't you see the sky above you? Don't you see the, you know, so Allah mentions His existence through His creation. Okay? Um, also verses talking about, for example, um, the uh, heavens, the orbits talking about the sun, the, the layl and the sun, the day and the night following each other. So examples from the creation which proves intelligence, which proves a system, which proves planning. And from that we know that there is a planner, there is a creator, there is somebody who devised the system. Okay? Because this is logical. 
This is easy for the human being to relate to. If you know there is a process, there is intelligence, there has to be somebody who is behind that intelligence. Intelligence does not come from nothingness. Right? Have you ever had a situation where you saw something which had no intelligence and suddenly became intelligent by itself? That never happens. Never happens. There has to be a process through which intelligence is initiated. Okay? Even the intelligent design, you know, the techniques which we use in engineering and, you know, we have now computers, we have all these things which talk back to you, the GPS guides you, these are intelligent things. To say that these came by themselves would be a joke in our time. Right? Obviously people sat and they designed these things, obviously people who were intelligent, they, they made plans for these things and so now we have these things which are intelligent. So it is very simple but a lot of times common sense is overshadowed by philosophical arguments. Or theories which people come up with in the name of science or so on and so forth. So you have to be careful with that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He proves His existence through His creation uh, in the Quran, the Meccan phase. The third thing which the Quran in the Meccan phase uh, concentrates a lot on is afterlife. Okay? Is afterlife. And this is very, very important for your practical um, implementation of Islam. Most of our weakness in our practical Islam is because of our weakness in our weak aqidah in afterlife. What does that mean, weak aqidah? means, yes, you know there is a Jannah, but you don't prefer it over the dunya. That's a weak aqidah. You know there is a paradise, but you still prefer the benefit you're getting right now over the benefit which is promised to you. Okay? You know there is a hellfire. You know it's bad, you don't want to go there, you don't want to burn there, but you still still prefer saving yourself from troubles of this dunya over that other one. Let me save myself from this trouble right now. That one, we'll see. We'll see when we get there. That's the mentality, that's weak aqidah in afterlife. So yes, you believe in afterlife, but really you don't give it preference over the dunya. Okay? Whereas the Sahaba, by, by the time they got their training done in the Medinan phase, they had no problem following the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they always preferred akhirah over dunya. They don't care if they lose here. No matter, I am the biggest loser in this dunya, but as long as I make it there, I don't mind it. That's how their attitude was. For us, no. No matter what happens to me over there, I want to be successful here. Once again, it's a weak aqidah. It's The aqidah is there. I'm not saying that we don't believe in akhirah. We believe in akhirah. But once again, it is weak to the point that we don't give it preference over. Whenever there is a conflict, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about areas where there is no conflict. Because there are many, many areas where you can do well in the dunya and you can do well in your deen. Okay, in akhirah. But there are areas where there will be conflicts. That's the test, right? That's the test. Allah is saying this is haram. Say, let me do it because I have some benefit I get in this dunya. Allah is saying, do it. You say, no, I don't want to spend too much time doing this because then I'm going to lose out on these other things I want to do in this dunya. Conflict occurs between akhirah and dunya. And that's what will determine which one you prefer. Which one you want to make uh, best for yourself. And which one you want to sacrifice. You can, you know, you have to sacrifice things. Even when you're getting a degree, you want to get a degree, you sacrifice a lot of your nights studying. You want to do well on an exam, you sacrifice going to a party. You sacrifice having guests over, hanging out with buddies, so that you can spend that time and study and do well. Same thing for Afira. A lot of times you'll have to give away certain parts of this dunya and say, later, whenever I have time. And trust me, if you have that attitude, you'll never get time for the dunya. Because Afira is going to just you know, take so much of your time. And that's how it should be. We should spend more time on Akhirah and this dunya should be there but as a uh, need, on a need basis. On a need basis. We're not here to build castles. We're not here to become millionaires, billionaires. That's not the point. Even if you do, you're going to lose all of that one day. So it's, it's a, it's, in a way, it's a wasted effort. If you spend too much effort on this dunya, it's a waste of time and effort on your part. You're going to lose it anyway, one day. So yeah, spend effort, have a good life, but give preference to the author.
Since there was no way for human beings to know about the next life, the Meccan revelations vividly described its wonders, its mysteries, and its horrors. Okay? And this is one of those areas you, you cannot reach by your intellect. If I ask you, come up with your intellect and tell me what happens in the grave. Tell me what happens in the hellfire. Tell me what happens on the day of judgment. You and me have no ability from our brains, from our experiences, even if all of us get together, the human beings and the jinn, and we want to come up with a, you know, a story of what happens afterwards, there's no, there's no basis for that. There's no proof for that. Okay? All these uh, amazing movies, these trilogies, which are based on you know, these different worlds, and you know, this is probably what we will come up with. <laughs> Something like that. Star Wars kind of a hellfire and paradise version of, of that. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the truth through the Quran and the Sunnah because there was no way for us to know these truths by our own experiences. The fourth thing which the Quran talks about in the Meccan period is past generations, the stories of the previous nations who denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what happened to those nations. For example, we have the story of Ad and Samud, which, which are not even mentioned in the Bible actually. Um, Intentionally, the Bible authors, they did not mention the Arab prophets. These were pre, uh, pre-Islamic Arab prophets, which came in Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Prophet Hud salam, Prophet Saleh salam. these were all prophets which are not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, but Allah mentions them, especially to the Arabs, because they can relate to them. These are in their same, same area, in the same peninsula. And the Arabs actually used to see their ruins. Whenever they would travel up towards Sham, they would see the ruins of these past nations. Whenever they would travel towards Yemen, they would see the ruins of these other nations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded them, don't you see those ruins? Don't you see what happened to those nations before you? So through these stories, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala builds their aqidah in uh, obedience, that you need to obey Allah, otherwise you can get into trouble. Okay? The fifth one is Salah. And this, as I said, was the only was the only law that was revealed in Mecca. Out of all the other pillars, Salah, the prayer, was the only one revealed in Mecca. Because of the critical relationship between Salah and Tawheed, Salah was the only other pillar of Islam to be legislated in Mecca, besides the declaration of faith. What is the link between Salah and your Tawheed? What is that link? Why did Allah reveal Salah was the first one? How does it strengthen your Tawheed? The salah. The prayer. Reminds you of what? It reminds you of Allah on a continuous basis. You cannot forget. A person who prays five times a day, it is impossible for this person to forget Allah. As soon as you forget Allah, the next prayer comes. As soon as you think about something else, the next prayer comes. Okay, you're constantly being reminded about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. Number two, it is a dress rehearsal or rehearsal for the day of judgment. What is Salah? What are you doing in Salah? You're talking to Allah. Okay? And you're saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmideen. For each verse you say, Allah is responding to you. Even though you cannot hear Allah, but the Prophet peace be upon him said, every time the servant says this, Allah talks to his angels and says, look at my servant, he praised me. Look at, uh, look at my servant, he, re- he remembered me. And then Allah says, for him is what he asks for. Ihdina surat al mustaqim Allah guide us. Allah said, for him is what he asks for. Okay. So every time we say something, we're talking to Allah. It's basically a communication. When you're praying to Allah, you should imagine you're talking to Allah. What will happen on the day of judgment? You will be before Allah. What is the difference? On the day of judgment, you will be talking to Allah while you can see him. Day of judgment, we will be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In salah, you're talking to Allah, you are praying as if you see Him. What is the highest level of salah, the prayer? Is where you have the level of ihsan. What is the level of ihsan? That you pray as if you see Allah. You imagine Allah is in front of you. So, whenever you do that process, it is a reminder for the day of judgment. That one day I'm going to be doing the same exact thing I'm doing five times a day. I'm going to be doing before Allah on the day of judgment. I will be talking to Him. I will be answering questions. I will be the one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be interviewed. So five times a day you have an interview with Allah. 
kind of rehearsal for an interview. So that's why Salah builds your Aqidah. Salah builds your Aqidah in Allah, Salah builds your Aqidah in afterlife. Constantly reminds you about afterlife. This world is not as important as the next world. Okay? That is the importance of Salah. And the final thing in the Meccan revelation, the Meccan phase, is challenges. Challenges which prove the miraculous nature of the Quran. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He challenged the people of Quraysh and the Arabs and the whole world actually. Saying, if you think this book is not from Allah, find a contradiction in it. Find something which is a contradiction. Where Allah says one thing in one verse and another verse He is contradicting Himself, saying the opposite. Because that what, that's what happens with human efforts. No matter how much you try, you will end up contradicting yourself. I know this because of my talking experience. Because you'll say something in one lecture, and then three lectures later I'm saying something else, and a brother said, but brother, didn't you say, you know, four lectures ago that this was the case? Like, yeah, I did contradict myself in it. That's what happens. As human beings, we all the time, we keep contradicting ourselves. Authors, books which are written, especially religious books, they are full of contradictions, human effort. Then Allah said, if this book is not from Him, bring a book like it. Because it should be easy for you if you claim that Muhammad, peace be upon him, the illiterate man, came up with this book, then you who are literate, who have PhDs, should be able to bring a better book than him. He's an illiterate man. He's never said any poetry before. You have so many people who are masters in literature. Bring a book like it. They were not able to do so. Then Allah lowered the challenge. Said if this is too much too difficult for you, bring ten chapters like Ten chapters. Ten chapters, how much will be ten chapters? Ten surahs of the Quran. How many surahs are there in the final juz? If you select ten small surahs from them and say, okay, bring ten surahs like these ones. Okay. Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Nas, Falaq, Tabbat Yada, Surah Al-Nasr, Kafirun. Count ten surahs. Say, okay, bring ten surahs like this. It's about four or five pages. Allah is challenging the entire humanity with five pages of scripture, which can stand as the Quran stand. Not able to do it. And then finally, Allah revealed the verse and says, if you think this is not from Allah, bring one chapter like it. What is the smallest chapter of the Quran? Kawsar, Surah Al-Kawsar. How many verses are there in Surah Al-Kawsar? Three. What is Allah challenging the entire humanity with? Three verses. Three verses. Just bring three verses. It's even as small as Surah Al-Kawsar. Not able to do it. Did they try? I mean, I'm not just saying this out of, okay, they were not able to do it. No, 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 they tried. Many of them tried to imitate the Quran. There was a famous poet who tried to imitate the Quran, he said, I'm going to lock myself up in my house and I'm not going to come out until I'm able to bring a book like the Quran. After a few days, the people saw him in the marketplace shopping. He said, what happened? What happened with your project? You know, you were, you were saying you were going to do it. He said, for some reason, whenever I tried to do it, whatever I wrote was miserable made no sense. Whenever I tried to do it, I was not able to do it. And I am a great poet. He said, I'm not a, like a bad, I'm a great poet. I'm not able to do it. He gave up on that project. If you look at the Quran which Musaylam al kazab who was one of the false prophets, he also came up with his own Quran. Came up with his own Quran. Would you believe it? And you know, his followers would recite that Quran and so on and so forth. But one of his close followers, he came up to him one day and he said, I don't understand your Quran. I don't understand, did Jibreel reveal this Quran in your heart or in your stomach? Because all his verses were about eating and drinking. <laughs> Say, what kind of Quran do you have? Did Jibreel come to your heart or he came to your stomach? So even his own people knew that this was just rubbish. This was not Quran, this was not revelation. So this was a challenge which many people tried to take out, but they were not able to. And when we say challenge, it is a challenge in all ways. Linguistically, there is no book in Arabic which can compete with the Quran. Linguistic, in grammar, 
in its word usage. This is what Brother Zahid was doing in the last year or so. This was his topic, uh, linguistic miracle of the Quran, scientific miracle of the Quran, verses which talk about scientific phenomenon which is discovered in our times. Historical accuracy, talking about past nations, you know, using words and using, you know, examples from past nations, naming individuals which were not known in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, like Haman. Haman is named in the Quran as one of the advisors of Fir'aun. According to the Bible, there was no such advisor named Haman. What did Fir'aun ask him to do in the Quran? Haman. He told him to build like a, a pillar, like a, a tower for him so that he can ascend in this tower, see the God of Musa. He tells his minister, in the last century, one of the French archaeologists discovered a stone tablet and on it were the names of the ministers of one of the pharaohs, which is the pharaoh which we know of to be the Pharaoh in the Quran. And in it, it said name of ministers and it said Haman, minister of stone works. Stone works, architecture. He was the minister of Pharaoh in architecture. So historical accuracy of the Quran, things which were not known before. Nations, Ad and Thamud. The nation of Ad was discovered through powerful images from satellites in outer space. When they discovered in southern Arabia, there are river basins, and they discovered that hidden underneath the sand, there, had, there is a nation. And then when they started digging, they found that nation which the Quran talks about. The nation of Hud which was destroyed in this sandstorm for seven days and you know, eight nights, so on. So historical accuracy, you cannot compete with the Quran. So in any way or form, whether linguistic, historical, scientific, or otherwise, bring a book like it. So when we say that Quran is a miracle, we don't just say it for the sake of saying it. We really mean it is a miracle, meaning let's bring any other book and try to compare it with the Quran. So on and so forth. So challenges was another, you know, big subject in the Meccan revelation. Inshallah, next week we are going to start talking about the Medinan revelation and some of its features. And now, quiz time. So I hope you are ready for your quiz. <laughs>